Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. As we approach the one year anniversary of COVID's lockdown officially, we revisit also our last guest in the studio. I'm Chris William and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running source of Carolina business, policy and public affairs. And on this program, an executive profile and an in-depth conversation with the president of the Richmond's Federal Reserve, Tom Barkin. We start right after this. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring Tom Barkin, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. And welcome again to this dialogue and this conversation. We are glad to have with us once again. And we had him, interestingly enough, a year ago, our last guest in the studio before the COVID lockdown, the president of the Richmond District of the Federal Reserve, uh, Mr. Tom Barkin. President Barkin, welcome again. And I'm glad to see you looking uh, happy and, and healthy, I hope. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be back. And uh, I look forward very much to being back with you in person. Well, th thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Tom, let's start, you know, as we look back over the last year, and here we are almost a year since the lockdown began, um, I think it's not overstating it to say over the last year, we've had epic unknowables about the market, about our community, about our public health. How have we done so far? Well, it's um, awfully hard to, um, to answer that question because we've done two things that are just completely unprecedented, right? You know, one thing is, uh, we shut the entire economy down. And that was literally the week after I was, you know, with you last March. And of course, we'd never done that before. And the second thing we did that was unprecedented is we threw three, four trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus uh, into the mix. And the way those two interacted, I think, has been, you know, really quite telling. You know, obviously, when you shut the economy down, a bunch of people uh, lose their jobs, a bunch of small businesses are in trouble, segments like aerospace and oil and gas and hospitality, you know, all struggled. But at the same time, all the stimulus ended up in people's pockets. Uh, savings rates are elevated uh, massively and people with money locked down at home without much to do actually found themselves rotating their spending into goods. And so we saw a huge increase in uh, the sales of really anything related to the house you know, paint or wallpaper, patio furniture. Uh, I was in Hickory uh, a couple months ago and the furniture business is just, you know, through the roof, golf clubs, boats, you know, all that stuff is up. Um, credit cards balances are actually way down. Normally in a downturn, they would be up, but now they're, they're down because people paid down their debt. And so you've got this situation where uh, if you want to think about it this way, there was a big uh, valley, and we just threw a ton of money into the valley so that people could make their way across. And so in total, the economy has done actually incredibly given what's happened. There's obviously huge dichotomy, uh, both in terms of uh, industries, like I talked about, aerospace, oil and gas, uh, 
uh, leisure and hospitality entertainment, but also individuals. You know, the, um, there's still 10 million people more unemployed or out of work than there were uh, a year ago. And those 10 million people are disproportionately from these low end, low income, personal contact service jobs. People are disproportionately young. They're disproportionately women. Uh, they're disproportionately people of color. Well, do, do we want, you know, there's so much there. Do, so do we want, is this, a, is this a reset of expectations? Is this a moment in time? Or is, is, will we see, can you extrapolate out, Tom, with some degree of confidence that this new norm, the way we spend, the way we save, the way we interact, even the jobs and those available to work, is all of this changed? Is this how it's going to be or some semblance of how it's going to be? I'm always hesitant to declare a massive sea change. You know, I was around for 9-11. Um, I, I traveled a ton in my old job, but you know, three months after 9-11, we were convinced we were just not going to travel the same way again. And then three years later, we were all traveling. And so, um, you know, the vaccine uh, is here, seems to be effective, uh, despite, you know, some of the supply chain issues is being rolled out. It's quite easy for me to imagine. And certainly my, you know, core assumption is we're going to have a vaccine. It's going to be rolled out. It's going to be effective. And by and large, people are going to be able to go back to work the way they used to. Now, some things will be different. Uh, I think businesses will be more open to flexible work uh, than they used to be. And I think that'll be a good thing. There's obviously a lot of small retailers and maybe small restaurants that are out of business and aren't going to come back. And so some of that sector is going to migrate. Uh, we've accelerated a move to online retail, uh, telehealth, which in many cases wasn't even paid for by insurance, is now a more accepted thing. So there are business changes that are happening, but I'm not one of those people who think we're never going to travel again. And I certainly hope I'm going to be able to go to a ball game again. You know, but you talked about the uh, epic stimulus at the time at the beginning of last year, three or $4 trillion. And here we are even more. Is there too much credit? Do we have too much liquidity? Or how do we start to even think about paying this back? And then we'll get to of course, the inflation question, but let's start with the massive amounts of stimulus now that are part of the debt load of this country. Well, so when you think about debt, you know, I start really broadly. So I look at all kinds of debt and actually, and, you know, despite what you might see, the total debt in this country today isn't meaningfully higher than it was 15 years ago. Now the mix has shifted a lot. Uh, financial debt, you know, uh, banks have a lot more capital than they used to. And so their debt is down. Personal debt is actually significantly down because people delevered, as I said, uh, in this crisis, but also coming out of the financial crisis. Corporate debt is up and now government debt is up. So to me, this isn't an issue of the level right now. It's the issue of the trajectory. And of course, the trajectory of the, of the federal deficit is significant. Uh, it was 38% debt to GDP in 2007. It's over 100% projected for this year. And so that's not a trajectory that's uh, sustainable. And so the question is not, should we be spending now to build a bridge over this um, chasm that we've just gone through? The question is, are we gonna have the institutional will to on the other side of the chasm, you know, rationalize the, the government spending and the government deficit? I think that is an important question for us. So what's the answer? Well, it's in the future. I mean, the legislators have in their hands the power to do it. There's a piece to reducing the, the federal debt and the deficit, which is growth. And there are a number of pro-growth things we can and should be doing, including uh, expanding the size of the workforce and bringing more people in and, and investing in, in productivity and the like. And then there's uh, you know a set of things around spending and, uh, and revenue collection. Mm -hmm. And again, I. Uh, you can't look at this year's budget and say we're doing much on those two things. But, you know, I think if they're going to have it in their hands to do it going forward, and I certainly hope we will. So, so you don't have to go far to understand the inflation connectivity to all of this liquidity and, and flush with cash, both personal and corporate. Uh, it seems like the Fed has been is telegraphed more than once that there is some tolerance for a higher level of inflation. Does that go along with the idea that all of this money, and this is not very technical, Tom, but all this money sloshing around could absolutely push, push inflation higher. And what would a high end tolerance be for inflation uh, by the Fed? Yeah. 
So let me make uh, the case for inflation and maybe the case against inflation, because you obviously don't know what the future is going to be. Yeah. Um, I talked about an elevated savings rate because of you, you know, you called it the money sloshing, but the fiscal stimulus that was put in there, there's right now a trillion and a half more money uh, in people's savings in this country than there was at the beginning of the crisis. And so you can think of that as deferred stimulus or, you know, spending yet to come. Uh, so that's going to be powerful. And it's easy for me to imagine that in the context of a vaccine, right, people like me who haven't been spending the way we used to, we're going to say, great, you know, I've got some excess savings. It's time for me uh, to spend again. At the same time, uh, there was an article uh, recently about some of the challenges the automakers have had trying to get chips. Um, you know, maybe a lot of industries will have constrained supply. It's hard to predict demand. And so if elevated spending hits constrained supply, that's, you know, part of the case for inflation. And you can put other things, declining dollar, minimum wage. You can put a lot of those things into a case for inflation. There's also a case against inflation. The case against inflation is um, inflation is not a one-time move in the price level. It's a continued move in the price level. And the fact that over the last 25 years, inflation has been quite moderate means that businesses and consumers actually have their expectations pretty much set. Um, you know, if, uh, if you see something and the price goes up 5 or 10%, do you accept it or do you shop it? And now you have tools to shop it, mm -hmm. whether that be, you know, online uh, or, or otherwise. Uh, and at the same time, you've got these big retailers. Uh, Lowe's is a great example, Home Depot who have a lot of purchasing power. And I talk to suppliers, they don't want to increase prices to these big uh, suppliers. And the big suppliers know that part of, big retailers know that part of their business is to provide everyday low prices. And so there's a lot of power holding inflation down. Just as a reminder, it's been one and a half percent for the last 10 years, which is a pretty moderate uh, pace. It's been one and a half percent for the last 12 months. And so, you can make a case for inflation, but I have to say there's also a pretty strong case uh, against it. And of course, we watch it closely and the Federal Reserve has the power, we've proven it in the past, that if we do see inflation beyond the moderate levels uh, we're comfortable with, you know, two, two and a half percent, then we have the tools to do something about it. And that willingness to act on our part is also a constraint on inflation because people aren't going to imagine it if they think we can stop it. Right. So it's moral leverage to some degree. Um, as we, we, we talk about the, the large dynamics of the economy, um, obviously in the early days, the big losers were those that work in restaurants or entertainment or, 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 or airlines or even transportation. Um, how, how do we now, and this is not insensitive, President Barkin, but the idea that the economy has a way of wringing out excesses and are we allowing enough of the economy with, with the, the size of stimulus packages, are we allowing enough of the economy to do its job as a free market economy mm -hmm. to wring out excesses, to allow some businesses to fail, and while other businesses to create and grow? Um, uh, you know, I do think one of the challenges when you put this much fiscal stimulus into the situation is that it's not perfectly tailored for the situation and it never will be. So the PPP is a great example. It's a very popular program, but it went to really all businesses. It went to businesses that, you know, had really significant needs and it went to businesses that, you know, the criteria was had significant uncertainty, but actually turned out to be uh, just fine. And a lot of this has been uh, reported. And among the businesses that really had the need, some of them were gonna go out of business anyway. Some of them will still go out of business. And so I, I take your point. There are businesses that have been helped along, you know, and, and maybe shouldn't. You see this in other places. A lot of states have uh, eviction constraints. And so you've got people who haven't paid their rent for many months and now have a very significant, you know, back rent due. But the state's saying no eviction. Well, in the end, what's going to happen there? Um, I've talked to utilities, uh, people who don't pay the utility bills, um, but uh, in various states, Virginia is a good example. Um, this, the utilities have been told you can't, you know, cut off service. Mm -hmm. So again, you've got a significant level of back utility bills, and 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 so all of these, I'll call it market interferences, are going to come to roost at some point. Uh, either 
with you know the rent or the utility bills being forgiven. There's a significant part of the recent stimulus package that's tenant assistance, uh, or um, it, people get evicted and those sorts of things. Uh, and so, um, whenever you artificially interfere with the uh, mechanisms of the market, you're going to have this kind of uh, issue. And I don't think this is any different. You know, it's interesting you bring up the housing and the mortgage and the rent. Um, has that become, and this, this is my term, but has that become a personal battleground for folks that have been caught um, for no, no fault of their own, but have been caught in this web of an economic, has it become a, and I hate to get too fancy here, but a, a socioeconomic battleground for folks um, who can't make their rent, can't make their mortgage, but still need some type of support and how much support do we give it? And oh yeah, by the way, is this a social justice issue or is this an economic inequality issue? And how, it's, it's a big question, but how do, you, how do you tease all that out and what's what? Well, there's a lot in that question. So that, um, I'm not sure I've seen the social justice issue, but what I, what I do see loud and clear is that uh, we're in a world where there's a high chance that more and more people are gonna be spending more and more time in the place that they live. And uh, that's part of the reason why housing related spending has been so robust because there's nothing like understanding the flaws of your house than spending all day in it, yeah. right? Um, and a huge thing that's, that's come to pass is uh, the emphasis on uh, technolo technological connectivity. Broadband is the shorthand for that. And so, uh, you know, I think it does, it's just like not having electricity. I think there is a huge proportion uh, in our smaller towns and in our inner cities uh, of people who haven't been able to, to get, you know, deployed this sort of online connectivity. And without that, I think that is a real gap. And you see it most clearly uh, in the classroom. Um, I was in West Virginia uh, talking to uh, parents who were taking their kids to the parking lot of McDonald's to sign into Wi-Fi so they could do their class schedule. And I, that's just not okay, I don't think. Um, we've got a program actually, if I can cross market just for a second, called Scarring in the Classroom, which starts this month. It's a online you know, video series. And some of the things our researchers are seeing in terms of the impact on kids of not, you know, uh, remote, uh, learning the risks of uh, being unsufficiently connected or insufficiently engaged mm -hmm. and, you know, what that does to future job prospects for people who are interested on our website. But um, I, I really do think that technological connectivity, that's really where the rubber hits the road here on this. And maybe that's the social justice point you were making. You, you get the feel or you, you get the sense that we are a lot closer or maybe even accelerating to in-person class again. I, I do think so. Um, and I, I think about it the same way that uh, in April, everybody shut the economy down because it seemed like the right thing to do. And in the absence of an alternative plan, that's where you went. Um, uh, I think if you look at cases over November, December, they were three, four times more elevated than they were in April. But very few political leaders shut their economies completely down. And I think that's because they saw the cost of shutting it down in, in March and April. And they saw that there were alternatives that actually could get us to the other side. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same way in schools. When you don't know for sure how the infection process works, when you don't have confidence that you can operate a school in a safe way, uh, it seems like a much easier decision. Today, I think the downside risks of uh, remote, uh, uh, you know, K to 12 education, I think have gotten increasingly uh, clear, and I think the upside case of we can operate this uh, safely has gotten clear as well. And so I think the trade-off uh, bends more toward getting people back in the classroom in a safe way, in a hybrid way, uh, whatever. But uh, again, every di jurisdiction is making their own decision on that. But I do see a trend toward that. And, and, and to apply that to something you just said, it talked about we all thought back in April, March, May of last year, and, and June and July, that the idea that you know, the whole game's change. We're all going to be working remotely and, but, and how great it is that we're much more or at least as productive. Have you changed the way that you feel about the percentage of people that will be working from home or some type of remote location then versus now? Um, and I wrote an essay on this uh, in the last week or so. I mean, I think we've proven to ourselves that we can work remotely. I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's not 100% comfort comfortable, and it's enabled mm -hmm. by the fact that everyone's working remotely. I always tease 
um, uh, manufacturers that I talk to, when they talk about their salespeople as being just as productive from home, I say, well, you know, what are you going to do the first time you lose a sale because one of your competitors was in somebody else's plant? And they go, yeah, I'm probably going to go back in the plant. So I think the real thing we're going to have to figure out is how to work hybrid. And how to work hybrid is not the same as working in person. It's not the same as working remotely. And the best way I think to illustrate it is think of the last time you were in a meeting with five people in a conference room and two people on the phone or video. You know, the five people in the conference room dominate the conversation. Um, there are conversations that happen on the way into the meeting. There are conversations that happen on the way out of the meeting. There's actually a lot of uh, uh, work that's been done on uh, how trust and collaboration works when you are together versus remote, and you can read body language and signals and those sorts of things. That would suggest, you know, uh, there's real value to being able to do the in-person body language uh, thing. And so I think, and, and, and as a company, if you believe in culture uh, as being your advantage, and if you believe in um, uh, that it's critical to bring in younger people and train and mentor and inculcate them in that culture, then I don't think we've yet figured out how to do that remotely. But that doesn't mean we can't be flexible. And so the trick to this is figuring out how to operate in a hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of that is figuring out which days it actually matters to be in person and programming those days. Part of it is a set of protocols for my seven person meeting. Maybe you call on the person on the phone or the video uh, first. Um, uh, you know, part of it is expectations, maybe even rebalancing. I think actually being clear on why you as a company care about people being in person and then delivering that. I think there's a chance if people are more systemic on it, we're actually going to get better culture, better mentorship, better development with less time in the office. And then that would be the win-win. Uh, we've got about three or four minutes left, and I do want to uh, uh, ask you some capital market questions. And I certainly understand, sir, as a sitting member of the Federal Open Market Committee and a voting member that you uh, have to, about setting monetary policy, you have to be careful about any statements around capital markets. But you, 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 like everyone else, saw a lot of the drama that happened around GameStop and Reddit and Robinhood and these huge market swings in specific equities. What what does that portend? What is does is that ringing out excesses? Is that posting on social media? Is that some more sinister thing that's going on in the markets? What what's going on? You know, I read it as the kind of euphoria that happens somewhat late in the cycle. Um, there were similar stories back in the '90s. I think there were similar stories in 2007, 2008. It seems relatively small to me, though. It's a few stocks. It's uh, buyers. I, I imagine those valuations aren't, you know, connected with reality. And of course, they're moving around uh, day by day as you and I speak. We'll see where they are when this is uh, when this is aired. But um, I, I didn't take much out of it. I think that feels like a little. Um, there's a great book, The Madness of Crowds. It just seems like a little bit of a tulip mania uh, over here, and uh, those things seem to come up in a recurring way in our society over and over again. Uh, for different reasons, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are driven uh, with the same kind of volatility. Different reasons, most likely. But um, will what will it will it take central central banks like the Federal Reserve, but, but global central banks to to sanction? And that's again, that's my term, sir. To sanction a cryptocurrency before we see some. Um, some baseline cryptocurrency that becomes not a standard, but pretty close to a standard. Right. So, um, so uh, think of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency right now as the value proposition right now is as a store of value. Um, it's being traded. It's being thought of like gold or like silver um, or like art or like baseball cards, something that's an alternative asset that you could money in, put your money into and that you hope it will retain or grow its value uh, over time. Um, and, and I don't have a, much of an opinion on whether that's a good investment or not a good investment, but that's sort of how I think about it. It's not, uh, it's not a currency. Um, you know, one of the core aspects of a currency is that the government stands behind it. Right. So no matter, you know, it's just a piece of paper in your wallet, but it's worth more than that because the government stands behind it. And, and there, 
I don't know who stands behind uh, Bitcoin and neither do you. It's an algorithm run by a set of people uh, that you are choosing to trust. Um, you know, some of the things I talked about, gold and silver, you know, maybe even art, um, you know, they have their value because people want something on the other side. There are uses for gold, jewelry, there are uses for silver in industrial applications. And so there's value to having it on the other side. I don't know what the value of Bitcoin is other than that. Yeah. Finally, um, without the government uh, standing behind it, you don't have it. And so for the government to do that, you'd have to have a, a use case. And I just haven't heard what a good use case would be yet. Um, you know, open to it, but haven't heard it. Okay. All right. Final, that's final word. Thank you, Tom. Um, well said in, in a short period of time on a complex uh, issue, as always, thank you for uh, joining us and uh, back in the studio, hopefully next time we have you, but nonetheless, we appreciate your leadership and your, all of your comments across the Carolinas. We hope you stay well and healthy. Look forward to it. Thanks, Chris. Yes, thank you. Thank you. President Tom Barkin, thank you for watching our program, carolinabusinessreview.org. Uh, for any questions or comments. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.